All right, let's set the scene. The year is 1989, and the very last episode of Doctor Who has just aired. The Doctor and Ace have strolled off into the sunset together, after a wild adventure involving motorcycle duels. Lesbian Free Cheetah's riding around on horseback, and in classic Doctor Who fashion, the Doctor nearly fucking murdering someone with a rock. At the time of filming, the cast and crew of Doctor Who had no idea that survival was quite possibly going to be the last ever episode of the show. But budget cuts from the BBC, and the lingering malevolent spirit of Michael Grade's influence over the show's poor airing time placement did the job, and the show was axed. Fans were obviously massively disappointed by this, especially seeing as the show had been running for a good quarter of a century by this point. But after seven Doctors, countless companions, and 26 seasons of sci-fi adventures across time and space, it seemed as if the curtain was coming to a close on this beloved British TV stable forever. Psych! It's 1991, two years later, and enter Virgin Publishing, with a range of Doctor Who adventures never before seen on TV. Fun fact, this is actually the same version as the airlines, and I will leave you to decide what to do with that information, because I don't know what to do with it myself. The Virgin New Adventures became a long-running series of full-length novels, featuring the Seventh Doctor and companions original to the books. But this was the sort of Doctor Who that you'd never see on TV. See, in the absence of any sort of BBC censors to stop them, and any sort of continuity to tie them to the show, uh, the writers of the Virgin New Adventures kind of went completely fucking hogwild. The new adventures were darker, stranger, sexier. Or at least, they tried to be darker, stranger, and sexier. And sometimes they did hit that mark, but uh, sometimes they just ended up being needlessly edgy and weird. Especially where continuity was concerned. It was a time of narrative anarchy. Body horror ran rampant. These books posited fascinating, never-seen-before plotlines, such as What if Doctor Who got super high and tried to fight the color blue? What if turtles were transphobic and, fuck it, sky pirates, and it was great. Or rather, it was a bit hit or miss, but I unironically adore the new adventures. Sure, when they're bad, they're uh, really bad, but when they're good, you know, they're pretty good. I cannot stress enough how the aforementioned story about the Doctor getting high to fight a sentient color is maybe one of the best books I've ever read. These books, despite getting increasingly strange and obscure with the lore, the barely concealed kinks of the people writing them, and the amount of body horror contained within, kept on trundling for a good six years with regular releases. And boom, it's 1997, and the final 60th book of the series has been released. And this is where the fun really starts. Longbarrow's elevator pitch premise is simple. The Doctor, along with his friend Chris, accidentally arrive at his childhood house and home of Longborough, and the Doctor is promptly accused of murdering the head of house. Go figure. House Longborough also happens to be a little bit eldritch and a little bit alive, and Chris is going a little bit mad because of all of the vitally plot-important flashbacks to the Doctor's past that he keeps on having. From there, it evolves into a gothic Gallifrey murder mystery, featuring cameos from all of your favorite characters, and a deep dive into the mysterious past of both the Doctor and Gallifrey itself. Um, I won't spoil the plot of the murder mystery aspect, because in my opinion, it's actually really cleverly done, and it's definitely worth a read if you've ever kind of, you know, wondered to yourself what Knives Out would have been like if it was written in the late 90s and also set on an alien planet with bonus time travel. Huh. Oh my god. Lungbarrow is just alien knives out. Lungbarrow was controversial for many reasons. It continues to be controversial, especially if you frequent the same esoteric circles of the Doctor Who fandom that I tend to. Uh, there's a few reasons for this, not least the fact that Lungbarrow is one of the new adventures that strongly cements the ideas of timelers being loomed rather than born. A lot of people don't like looms for some reason. Big goof for the arts and crafts community, I guess. Another reason a lot of fans object to Lungbarrow is because it commits the cardinal canonical sin of actually showing us the Doctor's family and backstory firsthand. And if you've been paying attention to some of the backlash from Chris Chibnall's Timeless Child plot arc from the recent seasons, then you'll know just how weirdly intense some fans tend to get about that sort of thing. And I always get where they're coming from. 
When you've got such an important main character that has the mystery of who they are practically encoded into the show's title, any big revelation about their backstory and origins is going to be massively disappointing to some, if not most, of the fanbase. Even if the reveal in this case is delightfully weird and involves creepy Time Lord houses where the furniture is not only oversized, but actively sentient, and part of a subplot that involves the Doctor's deeply unethical childhood genetic creature experiments. Hell yeah! Lung Barrow also strongly implies that the Doctor is secretly the other, one of the three main founders of Gallifreyan society, is half-human on his mother's side, Natch, and for some reason also lightly implies that Leela, of all people, is his mother. And somehow that's not even the weirdest part of this book. Like, I can't stress this enough. The furniture is sentient, people. There is almost nothing cooler than sentient furniture, apart from maybe the equally sentient house it all resides in. Still, I'm aware that not everyone is as enthusiastic about sentient houses full of dark, horrible secrets as I am. Different strokes for different folks, different homes for different gnomes. I don't know where I was going with that. Maybe you don't like Lung Barrow and, you know, that's okay. Maybe you do like Lung Barrow and that's equally as okay. Uh, the world's too weird and scary for me to risk my mental health getting into angry debates on the internet about obscure Doctor Who books and spin-offs. You know, find the bits of canon that you do like, ignore the rest. Chase your bliss. And for God's sake, stay off Twitter if you value your sanity. Please. Due to several factors, an unusually high demand, an unusually low initial print run, and Virgin's Doctor Who license expiring before they could do a second printing, there aren't as many copies of Lung Barrow as there are of other New Adventure Doctor Who books. Which means that the copies that do exist are frequently sold on eBay for cutthroat prices. At the time of filming, eBay's most recent Lung Barrow copy was selling for 720 Australian dollars and 28 Australian cents. Plus shipping. I, I could get life insurance with that amount of money. I could get a decently priced euphonium. Like, I don't want one and I don't need one, but I could. I could buy 1,250 kilograms of pure sugar or 32.7 of these knockoff sonic screwdrivers I found on AliExpress. Or I could blow all of that money on one single book. And considering that these sorts of eBay auctions go out pretty regularly, apparently at least one someone is doing exactly that. So, if Lung Barrow is out of print, then how is it that fans are still able to read it? Well, in August 2003, the BBC put up an ebook edition of Lung Barrow on the website, featuring revisions and commentary from Mark Platt himself, as well as a gallery of gorgeous original illustrations. This was kept up until 2010, although some copies of the ebook are still floating around on the internet. Judging by the increasingly ridiculous prices physical copies are still going for, there's definitely demand for a Lung Barrow reprint. Uh, but a lack of license and the fact that the BBC probably has better things to do with the time means that it's very unlikely. Fortunately, I don't have that problem. I apparently have nothing better to do with my time, which is why I'm sitting here doing this video and um, doing other things. Uh, hold that thought. One more thing to discuss before we get there. Sometimes I like to think about what I do with a physical copy of Lung Barrow. I've discussed it at great length with my friends because um, what to do with a physical copy of Lung Barrow is apparently the sort of topic that I do, in fact, discuss at length with my friends. Which either says something about my friends or it says something about me, and I'm not sure which. The thing is, once you've got your hands on one of the most highly coveted books in this corner of the fandom, you've kind of got to do something with it. Like, what are you going to do? Just put it on your shelf next to the rest of your Doctor Who novelizations and novels and forget about it forever? Nah, come on! If you pick something unique enough to do and you make it public enough, you're going to go down in Doctor Who fandom history forever. I don't know if I personally want that sort of attention, but the thought is a kind of info hazard in itself because pulling some sort of wild, unprecedented stunt with the most sought after book is horribly alluring, actually. Is that just me? It, it might just be me. Like the guy on Doctor Who 4 Chan years back who got a copy of the dang thing and promptly grilled it with cheese. 
Like, I, for one, am never gonna forget them. Um, I could burn it. Horrifying to contemplate. I could set it in jello, which is even more horrifying to contemplate, because then I'd have to deal with the consequences of my own actions. I could stop trying to come up with ideas on my own, because no man is an island, and I could ask my friends what they would do with a copy of Lungaro instead. Suggestions for my dearest friends include dunk it like a basketball, rip it apart and mulch it for my two-scale paper mache model of half one girl itself. Oh, look at that. Did you know you can turn paper into yarn? Introducing the Lung Barrow sweater. Cozy, stylish, and devastatingly expensive. And finally, what the fuck is wrong with all of you? I would read it like a normal person. A good and true point, but may I remind you that no normal person would be shelling out $720 plus for a single obscure Doctor Who book. If you've actually got a copy in your hands, chances are things are about to get weird. Speaking of getting weird... Look, I like Doctor Who. I like it to degrees that my family and friends would call disturbing. I also happen to love Lung Bear in particular quite a lot. But that being said, there's still no way in hell that I'm going to shell out 720 Australian dollars and 28 Australian cents, plus shipping, for a single obscure book, no matter how great it is, and no matter how many terrible, hilarious acts I could inflict upon it for internet clout. So, obviously, instead of paying a god awful amount of money, I have spent the last several months typesetting, reformatting, illustrating, and hand binding my own copy of Lung Barrow. Because that's the only logical solution to a problem like this. So, here it is. It's not the most expertly bound or perfectly printed book out there, but with projects like this, I've started to find that I don't actually care so much about getting it entirely perfect. It's all about the journey of getting there. And even though it took me like half a year to arrive at this point, there's not a thing about the making of this copy of Lung Barrow that I regret. It gave me an excuse to reread Lung Barrow several times over as I set about the task of typesetting it and formatting it and double checking my facts so I could get all the illustrations just right. It gave me an excuse to dig into the lore and history of Wilderness Years Doctor Who to make this video, and also, you know, it gave me an excuse to make this video and talk about something that I love. And also I get my own copy of Lone Girl out of it. Like, sure, paying $720 plus shipping might have been the technically easier option, but in doing this, not only have I saved money, if not time, I've made myself happy. And. Happiness can be a little hard to come by these days, so I think that's worth a lot. Um, now, if you'll excuse me, I have a very good book to reread, and I definitely will not be dunking it in jello. I hear some beautiful man men spent several months illustrating it in full. <laughs> Why would anyone ever do that to themselves? <laughs>